A reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and around the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. I would be absolutely remiss if I did not take at least just a moment, or maybe several moments, to thank so many people who have made this morning possible. Uh, First of all, to Dean Sweeney, thank you so much for granting me this opportunity. I think I speak for all of us when I say that your presence in this community is truly an answer to prayer. Also, um, to Dr. George and Dr. Massey, who instituted this moment, um, I am deeply appreciative for the opportunity as well as for the sanctifying marks that they have left on this place. To all of the faculty and the staff, thank you for carrying all of us graduates to the end, for teaching us to love and learn the scriptures, for being faithful to pray for us. Um, Most especially to Dr. Smith, uh, my mentor, uh, the first person to teach me to preach, and for someone who's always been more concerned about my character than my competency, I'm thankful for you, sir. To my biological and my church family, Thank you for supporting me uh, through thick and thin unconditionally uh, to get me to this point um, of graduation. I'm deeply thankful for you and indebted to you. Um, And to my fellow students, those of us who are graduating, we have made it. The Lord has truly kept us. Um, We have suffered through studies together, and he has knit together a community that hell's kingdom cannot shake. And for that, I am grateful. And most especially to my lovely wife, Sarah Catherine, I love Jesus so much more (laughs) because of you. So thank you. Join me in prayer. As we've said already this morning, Lord, to you all hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts Be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. My goal this morning is extremely simple. That's a very freeing thing. Through this text and through the Spirit is my aim to convince you that Yahweh is faithful 
to fulfill all of his promises. Yahweh is faithful to fulfill all of his promises. And we will need two frameworks to apply to our theological imaginations as we look at this text. So close your eyes and think with me for just a minute. First, we will examine this text by beholding it with bifocals. We wish to see very clearly that which is very, very far off so that we can see very clearly that which is very near. We wish for this text to form us so that today in our life and in our ministry, we are formed to the image of Christ. So behold with me with bifocals. And second, we need to be willing to journey backward in order to journey forward. Uh, Recently, I rode a roller coaster that has a very anticipated climb to the top, but then it stops. It pauses. And behind you, you can hear the click of the track shift. And before you know it, you're off to the races backward to pause again and then to propel forward back where you expected to be. That's exactly what St. John is trying to get us to do with this text. He wishes to recall our minds to the promises of God in the Old and the New Testament. He wishes to jerk us backward in order to bring us back into this throne room with a new perspective. If we listen closely, we will hear the Spirit whisper, Do you remember? Many times throughout this text. And if we do remember, we'll catch the right track and we will see what John and the Lord want us to see with a new perspective. So, behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing together before the throne and before the Lamb. Do you remember? Do you remember the promise that God made to a man named Abram? That one day, though he couldn't see it, he would be the father of a multitude of many nations, that his descendants and family would be more numerous than the sands on the seashore or the stars in the sky. Do you remember that throughout all of Israel's history, through rebellion and strife and disobedience, the Lord was faithful to keep his end of the covenant? But what about now? It's easy to look backwards, but what about now? Do you go about your ministry in a community of loving people, yet you feel incredibly alone? Are you so despondent and detached in your depression that you really don't see how God could be there? Do you love people with the love of Christ, but it often returns to you void, and you feel as though your ministry is nothing more than just a band-aid? Do you pray and you intercede for your congregation, but there are factions within that it seems that the unity of Christ has not yet overcome? Brother and sister, look to this throne room. See the struggling soul that you're trying to shepherd in the presence of the Good Shepherd. See yourself, the Lord keeping you with his faithful loving kindness and bringing you to the end. See him envelop you with his Shekinah glory and wipe every single tear from your eyes so that you can make eye contact with the bridegroom and with his bride. In this place, no longer will any denominational or traditional distinctions divide us. No longer will we be bound in our sin to racism and nationalism. All nations, all tongues, all tribes. This is the church historic and the church eternal, all of us together worshiping the Lamb. And behold, the saints, you and I, we have received a wardrobe change. No longer are we wearing the green garb of spiritual guerrilla warfare. And no longer are we carrying in our back pocket a white flag that we are tempted to wave and surrender. But rather, in a great reversal, we will actually be wearing white robes of purity, and we will wave green palm branches of victory. Do you remember? Do you remember at the triumphal entry when the the 
Great crowds gathered, waving palm branches, saying, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Save us, we pray. In this scene, no longer will we ask the Lord to save us, for He will have fully and finally. Our hosannas will have been turned to hallelujahs. And we will join together in our new garb with our new palm leaves. And that will be the community that goes into all of eternity. And behold, we will sing this song with one great and loud voice. Do you remember the Tower of Babel? Do you remember how they and how we are so very prone to try to build and buy a name for ourselves? You see, on this day, no longer will that be our temptation. We will not be concerned about our own name, but we will be concerned only with one name, and that's the name of the Lamb. Do you remember how the people all before Babel had one language and the same word? Well, in this reality, the Lord takes the fallenness and keeps the different languages, but he still gives us back the same word. And that same word is the song that we sing together. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This great reversal that he enacts is something that only he can do. Our Lord has the habit of twisting our economy and flipping it upside down. Though we are very prone to put gold at the top and people at the bottom, we see the promise in Isaiah 65 that we will dwell together in unity, that we will build houses, and we will worship the Lord together. That day is coming. And behold, The angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Do you ever feel utterly, utterly alone in your worship? Do you ever feel as though you just need a reminder that there are, there's an entirely heavenly host declaring the praise and glory of our God? Know that in your most resounding and in your most whimpering declaration that God is good, in your most desperate remembrance of the thing long ago that he has done for you that is keeping you in this moment, when it is a struggle to remember, to reflect, to see the Lord's loving kindness in the past, there is a great cloud of witnesses. There's a heavenly host. And there is the Holy Spirit inside of you, all declaring together that salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb who sits on the throne. Even in our difficulty to remember his faithfulness, he is still faithful to fulfill his every promise. And then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes? From where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Behold, the saints, the church historic, in white robes have made it out. They've made it out of the great tribulation. The world, the flesh, and the devil will constantly assail the faith of the faithful. But Yahweh is faithful to fulfill all of his promises. Now, as you can imagine, when I read this text for the first time, I was elated to see the great tribulation in the text. It's certainly not anything that people have discussed or debated before. Um, I do agree with the early church and with those scholars who say that the great tribulation centers around Calvary's tree. The worst thing to ever happen and that will ever happen in the universe has already occurred. And by following him, what should we expect? 
The great tribulation is the Christian life of suffering, of obedience, of long suffering in a broken and fallen world. But do not make the mistake that that means things are necessarily going to get better immediately. Though we may be in the great tribulation right now, though your life may be a great tribulation, do not be deceived. There is greater tribulation still coming. Do not be surprised when the evicted enemy of this world ransacks the house on his way out. It seems as though every time we as humanity seem to think that we're improving, that we have no need for God, we're doing just fine on our own. We commit unspeakable and unthinkable atrocities against each other. And the church, we, we will cry out against this injustice, or at least we ought. And if we don't, we should probably get on our knees right now and ask that we do. We will cry out, and we will suffer the consequences. The world is not our home, and it is not really our friend either. But you see, throughout the scriptures, it is not necessarily the MO of Yahweh to deliver his people from tribulation but rather to deliver them through it. If they hated and crucified the Lord of glory, the only adopted, excuse me, the only begotten Son of the Father, will they not also hate the adopted sons and daughters of the Father? We follow a crucified lamb, and that requires us to be cruciform sheep. So we take up our cross we pile it on our backs, and we stumble, and we fall. We help one another along. We are hungry people telling one another where to find bread. And the world, the flesh, and the devil, they will pile on the weight to that cross. Our backs will blister, they will splinter, and we will feel as though we might not make it another step. But we look to the one who did who carried it all the way to Calvary's hill, who died the death that you and I deserve to die so that we might live the life he has intended for us to live. We follow a crucified lamb, and we are cruciform sheep. And behold, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Do you remember? Do you remember the promise that Yahweh made to Israel in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18? Come now. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, I will wash them white as snow. Our sins are as scarlet. Make no mistake about it. We are covered in blood. We are covered in the blood of the creation that we have mishandled. We are covered in the blood of the neighbors that we have hated. And we are covered in the blood of God himself. But his blood washes our blood out. There is a fountain, and it is filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood. They lose all their guilty stains. All means all. And I know if you're like me, in the back of your mind, your flesh is bringing something to the forefront. But what about? What about? All means all. Our robes are white because they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. That defies all sorts of chemistry and anything that we might know about color scheme. But this economy of God washes us pure. We have both purity and victory. This lamb who gave himself for us is both our substitute and our victor. You cannot have one without the other. 
So now we come to our third and final song of salvation. We have what the saints sing, and we have what the angels sing, and now we have what the elder tells us that we will all sing. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Do you remember? Do you remember God's promise to his people in Ezekiel 37 when he says that he will make his sanctuary dwell in the saints' midst? Do you remember that shortly after he breathes life and ligaments upon the valley of dry bones, he says that his everlasting covenant will remain everlasting, for his love is everlasting. Do you remember that he has promised to remember you? Our next couple of verses allude very heavily to Isaiah 49 and 25. Is written to a people in the midst of fierce geopolitical conflict, where the temptation of the day for the people of God more than anything is to trust in humans, to trust in kings, to trust in presidents, to trust in supreme courts. And though there is this temptation, the Lord remains faithful to fulfill all of his promises. They shall not hunger anymore, neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Ezekiel 37 also alludes to us and is trying to bring to our minds that there is both a a temple and a tabernacle. We will serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. We will serve him in the temple, and he will tabernacle around us. Just as the word became flesh and dwelt among us, once again, we will be in his presence. We will see him face to face. Do you remember how in the temple the priests would serve God day and night, and then even once a year they would enter into the Holy of Holies? In this throne room, we all are experiencing the fulfillment of the priesthood of all believers, and we are dwelling in that holy of holies, and we will see him face to face, and we will live. Do you remember the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles? Do you remember how Israel was commanded once a year for a week to build tents, out of palm branches, by the way, in which they might dwell And they might look out into the open sky above through the cracks in the leaves and remember that the Lord was the God who brought salvation from slavery in Egypt. Well, here we will have no need to build a tent, for the Lamb himself will build a tent of his presence around us. We will not need to remember our dependence upon God in this life, though we will praise him for it. But our very lifeblood, our very breath, will be breathing in our dependence upon him. We will dwell in the midst of the cloud, in the midst of the pillar of fire. He will consume us, and we will consume the feast that he has put before us in the king's banquet. If you flip a few pages into Revelation 21, it actually tells us that there will be no physical temple at all. But the Lamb seated on the throne will guide us. But for now, our souls are the very temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you need to remember that the presence of God in your life, Him being as near as your very next breath, it's not just a distant reality. 
It's not just something we are hoping for, though we do desperately. We need him to return and make all things right. We need him to restore the world and to restore order and to take us home. But what about now? Christian, you have all that you need. He has given you his very spirit, his very presence, and he has promised to help and guide and protect you. We are entering into a day where the sun will no longer strike us, nor the sun scorch us. We are entering into a day when sexual temptation will no longer strike you. We are entering into a day when anxiety and depression, praise God, will no longer strike you. We are entering into a day where natural disasters will no longer strike you. We are entering into a day when untimely death will no longer strike you. Because as Isaiah 25 tells us, he has swallowed up death forever. The snake actually will not strike us anymore because it struck Christ's heel upon the tree. The Father has sent the Son and the Spirit to purchase and to protect your perseverance, child of God. He is faithful to fulfill every promise, and that means that he will bring you home. Now, if you're anything like me, this all sounds great. But how? How can it be? How can I believe? I do believe, but you really got to help my unbelief, Lord. Hear me say that we are able to stand before the throne because the Lamb stood before the throne for us. As the modern hymn, which was actually composed just down the street, goes, My Savior left his throne above. He exchanged his wealth for poverty. He took my hate and gave his love. All this and more he did for me. The Lamb is not merely our example. This is not some impoverished, self-inflicting life that we are meant to live, that if we suffer long enough and hard enough and good enough, the Lamb will take us home. No, but in the great exchange, we will never in and of ourselves be worthy to stand before the throne. So the Lamb had to do it on our behalf. That is a sacrifice, and that is a victory that we can trust. He has not only given us purity, and not only given us victory, but the Lamb standing before the throne in our place secures our intimacy with Him forever. We have purity, we have victory, and we have intimacy with Him because He took our place and He won the day. He descended to the dead. He's raised to walk in newness of life. And he has ascended on high, where right now, Christ's full-time occupation, along with upholding the entire universe, is to pray for you, to intercede for you, to work with the Spirit within you, to conform you to the image of Christ, not necessarily rescuing you from trial and tribulation, but rescuing you through it. So as we close our time together, please remember that Yahweh is faithful to fulfill all of his promises. That Christ has secured for you your purity, your victory, and your intimacy with him. And that we are able to sing the song of salvation even now in order to remember. So together, let us sing the doxology as an act of remembrance. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
Praise the Lord. The Spirit stirred my heart so much during that sermon, I have to calm myself down here, I think, before I uh, make this presentation. Friends of Beeson, Jesus told us in the Gospel of Matthew that the church is what the theologians call indefectible. The evil one cannot destroy it or defeat it. And if you need any testimony to that, look at our Beeson students here today. The Lord is at work at Beeson Divinity School through the ministries of people like Will Sorrell, the rest of our student body, building up his church in very difficult times, and we're grateful to him. If you want to invest in his kingdom work, I invite you to invest in these students with your prayer and your time and your resources. The James Earl Massey Student Preaching Award is given each semester to a student who shows exceptional promise, proficiency, and fruitfulness in the ministry of the word. The late Dr. James Earl Massey was a mentor and friend to many of us here at Beeson. He went to be with the Lord in June of 2018. He was known as a prince of preachers, and his memory and his legacy as a minister of the Bible remain central to our life together at Beeson. Every semester, one of the graduating seniors is given the Massey Preaching Prize. And of course, this semester, the Massey Prize goes to none other uh, than our dear brother, Will Sorrell, who preached a wonderful sermon for us this morning on Revelation chapter 7, before the throne. God is faithful to fulfill all his promises. Amen and amen. Will is a graduating senior who's become a beloved member of our Beeson community. His professors have commended him as a bright, conscientious man, I'm quoting them here, with a godly, teachable spirit. At the beginning of his time with us, he told one of his professors, I want to learn how to approach a text with bold humility. I want to learn how to be broken by the text before preaching it. I want to learn how to clearly and creatively communicate the gospel through the text. Will's professors have described him as an effective communicator of the word who preaches with passion and purpose. He has a pastoral heart and a keen intellectual mind. And in the words of one faculty member, the best thing about Will is his wife, Sarah Catherine. <laughs> she is his stabilizer and greatest encourager. It is with great joy then that we present to Will our preaching prize for this semester, along with this certificate, which is a very simple one. I'll read it for us now. James Earl Massey Student Preacher Award, presented to Will Sorrell in recognition for excellence in preaching, November 19, 2019. Uh, Will, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. But in addition to the certificate, we're also giving Will a couple of books of Dr. Massey, and then a video recording of Dr. Massey's own Conger Lectures in Biblical Preaching here at Beeson, delivered in 2010 on the poetics of preaching. We're also going to send Will a small monetary award. I emphasize the word small so as to manage his expectations. Uh, it should be enough, though, so that he can take his best thing uh, out for dinner one of these days very soon. So will you please join me in thanking the Lord and congratulating Will on this honor. Thank you. 